to Six Figure Coaches with Luke Charlton, where every week we interview a successful coach and break down their business. We take you behind the scenes in their marketing, advertising, and sales campaigns. We show you what's working. We show you their frameworks, their proven strategies, so you can implement them in your business to grow. Now let's bring on this week's guest. Here is your host, Luke Charlton. Hey, this is Luke Charlton here. Welcome back to the Six Figure Coaches Show. Very excited to have you here in a little bit of a different location this week. I'm traveling um, back. To, I'm in Canberra visiting family. I'm just staying at an Airbnb. That's why the background is different to my office this week. Um, but I'm really excited to get in today's uh, in t- um, to interview today's guest. Again, another great guest. What we're going to be speaking about today, which I'm really excited for, uh, mainly for personal reasons, but, but I think it's uh, it is um, going to be super valuable, and that is like exit strategies for coaches, right? How would you go about exiting or selling your coaching business? Why is it important? Um, um, that That's going to be the general topic today. We've got a great guest who has a lot of experience in exits and selling companies and increasing valuations of companies. So I'm super excited to bring him on in just one moment. Just before we do, um, what I'm going to do, because I've never done this before, is I'm actually going to promote my business. So generally I promote like the Hermit Hole or I'll promote how to get interviewed on this podcast, but I'm going to promote my business. If you are a coach that is in need of more appointments, um, you want, I have an agency where we book appointments for you. We guarantee appointments in your calendar every single month. So we'll set up the system, we'll launch it, we'll tweak the ads, we'll run it until you get any consistent appointments in your, um, in your, in your calendar. And we guarantee those appointments. That's done for you. We also do done with you where we will guarantee appointments as well. But it's the guarantee slightly different, but we do work with you until the system is converting and generating revenue. So you're actually booking appointments and closing clients. It's the same system, which is done with you versus done for you, depending on what is a good fit for you. If you're interested to know if we can actually help you get those appointments, all you have to do is go to apply.lukechalton.com apply.lukechalton.com that'll take you to a short 15 minute call with us to see if we can help in the first instance. Okay. So with that being said, let me bring on today's Yes. Now I'm going to read off his bio because he's got some amazing experience here. So he is a CEO, um, a board member, uh, most of all an entrepreneur. Um, he's a leading authority in improving revenue of companies um, by improving their operational efficient uh, operational efficiency. Okay, so established businesses, but he has helped other coaches and consultants grow their business as well, which we'll get into uh, his story. He has helped with the acquisition and exit of more than 11 companies while seeing their collective revenue surpass more than 237 million. And he has successfully tripled the revenue of more than five companies in under two and a half years, adding an extra 950 million in valuation to these companies. And there's <laughs> there's a whole lot more to his bio. I'll be here for the next 10 minutes reading it off, but I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'm really excited to bring on today's guest, Ryan Nidell. Ryan, uh, welcome to the Six Figure Coaches Show. Luke, thank you so much for having me. I, I feel like I need to, to clap out my my PR team to create such an incredible bio, right? I know, I know. It's it's loves business. Yeah, it's really good. Actually, I know you, um, so you, let, actually, let's give me a background of, um, because I know you do a few different things. You are an, an actual, like when people say it's funny in these day, this day and age, like I'm an entrepreneur and they've just got like a solo freelance business or something, but you are actually an entrepreneur. I think you've got a few different things going on. So can you just give us a bit of background about, your story, um, companies that you've run or helped run in the past, what you're and up to all the way, you know, to kind of like what you're doing uh, now. Yeah, Luke, would, would be my pleasure. So at university, right, I studied mechanical engineering and it was only because math and science were really simple to me, not because I loved engineering. I'm actually more of an extrovert. So sitting behind a computer and designing things felt like purgatory during, during <laughs> you know, college, but nonetheless, you know, wrapped up my studies there jumped in the illustrious world of automotive sales. So in some capacities, I, I laugh in the sales, I was a used car salesman, but it really comes down to it. I, I ran high-end car dealerships and yep. that eventually led to the first entrepreneurial foray, which was, I was brought in to actually step into the affiliate manager role of a startup web hosting company and didn't know what web hosting was, didn't know affiliate marketing, didn't know direct response, didn't know any of this stuff. I just knew I could sell. When I came on board, we had 10,000 clients when we sold to a subsidiary of GoDaddy, about two years later, we had almost 580,000 clients. Wow. During that time, I took over as president and CEO, went through two capital raises, did a whole bunch of things that I wasn't qualified for in any capacity and learned a lot of really painful lessons about, about exits and, yep. and what not to do. That eventually led into owning a high-risk merchant processing company, processing credit card payments for gambling and, and some really obscure things where 
at 29, I thought I had the Midas touch. I thought anything I was going to touch turned to gold. Mm -hmm. And by 30, I was flat broke, right? Miscalculated ratios, took my eye off the ball. When I say flat broke, it was rental properties in foreclosure, truck was repossessed, right? There was, you know, maybe a negative 40 or $60,000 net worth. Like it was, yeah. we'll call it the, the rags to riches to rags story. <laughs> <Yeah. Yep. laughs> then recalibrated, eventually jumped into the CBD industry again, direct to consumer and grew that from 2016 to 2018, where I sold that to a private equity group out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yep. That then led to this unique part where I wasn't independently wealthy so I could retire, but I had a little bit of breathing room to decide what was next. During that time period, I started a podcast, which I think is incredibly beneficial, right? That's how you and I are connecting, of course. But I started a podcast where I was just sharing my truth, right? I had done all these things in life that I wasn't really proud of that I thought were looming over me like a dark cloud. Infidelity, yep. anabolic steroid use, failed businesses, all these things. And what I did was create a show where I was just sharing this stuff openly, right? There wasn't lead gen. It wasn't a path to something. And Luke, it was a seven day a week show without fail. It was 15 or 20 minutes and about 130 episodes in having a conversation like this. I say, Hey, if you've been listening, there's anything I can do to help you out at all with anything that I've been through, just send me an email to my personal email address and, and gave it out on, on the air. Yep. Well, two days later, I had 1,450 or so oh, wow. emails of people looking for something, right? So no merchant processing account, no sales team, no funnel, no process, yeah. no optimization. Like literally everything you're not supposed to do, I checked every one of those yeah, boxes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that eventually led into a coaching slash consulting. Except, except, sorry, I'll, I'll pause you there. Except for putting out a great offer. That was the one thing. Right? That shows the power of a great offer for the coaches listening in. It's not about... That's where it always starts, right? Your offer. Anyway, sorry, keep going. I just thought I'd point that out because it's a, an important lesson. No, I, I absolutely love that, Luke. I'd like to even poke at that if you're okay with it. Like sure. my offer at that moment in time, I had shared, right, all those things that I, I'm making mention of, right? There wasn't a, this wasn't intentional for lead gen. Mm. And my offer was essentially, if you've been listening, you consume more than five or six episodes. And there's something that I have been through that you think I could impart upon you to help you conquer something similar, right? I'm, I'm not a licensed therapist. I'm not a, I'm not qualified other than by life experience. But if you think for some possibility that, that might help you, just reach out and we can have a conversation. So there was no price anchor. There was no one thing. There was no, I like the five ones, right? One market, one, yep. one platform. Right. Yeah. One price point, one, one conversion, yeah. one year, like kind of the normal stuff. I didn't do any of that stuff. It was just, I want to generally help. And I think so much of that is, as we get into the second half of my story, so much of that is, is paramount for coaches and consultants. What happens when you just genuinely want to help someone, right? Money mm -hmm. becomes, I don't say the byproduct because we, we all need capital, right? We, we, it, it's a, it's a measuring stick, but what happens when it's authentic that you're not just looking at the dollars and cents, you really want to make an impact. No different than you shared to start the show like your company to me is based around truly impacting the lives of other coaches it, it comes through in all of your content it comes through in your messaging here it's not sure certainly maybe there's some dollars and cents that exchange hands but it comes from the intentionality behind it which i think is paramount as we go forward mm -hmm. and so right luke i put that offer out eventually worked it down to the most inefficient way possible to coach people i was doing one-to-one -one calls an hour yeah. an hour per person Per week, I had 33, 34 clients. It was a 12 week session with me. It was a thousand bucks a month per client, 90 yep. day commitment. And I got to the end of 90 days, Luke, and I was just burnt. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had, I had everything from individuals that were just graduating college that were trying to figure out how to come out of the closet and, and own their homosexuality and didn't know how to tell their family, which I didn't have any experience with personally. Yeah, all the way into, you know, a 65 year old music executive from Nashville that wanted to sell his business and I had everything in between. So no product market match, no market message fit. Like I didn't have any, any of that stuff. And so recalibrated and said, Hey, this has been fun, but I'm exhausted and I don't want to carry everybody else's weight. Like it, it was a good test for me. So circled back through with those cl clients that I knew I would have conversations with just like you and I are without any sort of exchange of, of, of money. Like who did I generally enjoy having conversations with? It happened to be, they all were business owners during that period of life. And so went back and interviewed them to try to understand why they decided to work with me, what worked, what didn't. And they also heard some version of, they wish that we would have spent more time in, in the true aspects of business. So I kept telling myself the story because I failed in that merchant processing business that I wasn't good at business. I didn't understand marketing. No one would ever want to listen to me. 
And so this group of six or seven individuals said, gosh, if, if you just taught us what you did wrong, there'd be mm -hmm. a lot of value there. So well, I can certainly do that. So then I put all seven of those individuals in a, in a group, right? So I create a leverage model. Same price point, same investment, but now it's a, an hour and 15 minutes once a week. And I'm, you know, seven individuals at $1,000 a month. So, and not that money is all of it, but it was this, it was a shift all of a sudden of, okay, I can, I can really condense on the amount of time, increase the impact. I started to realize that there were so many lessons that were, if person A was dealing with something and they needed help, person D just hadn't raised their hand yet to share that they were dealing with the same issue. So that leverage mm -hmm. model actually really helped everybody in that group grow pretty rapidly. Um, that eventually into, as I was looking at the business owners, some of the people that from my previous seasons of life, right, that, that merchant processing company, the, the uh, web hosting company, the CBD company, there were people that were in my purview that had seen me grow and sell these businesses, well, obviously not grow and sell the, the merchant processing company. And they started reaching out and saying, hey, would you mind helping us just, just tell us what you did to sell your company? We want to sell. Yeah. Well, again, I'm, I'm not an investment banker. I, I don't have some magic formula, but I can share what we did, right? Just real life experience. And that led to, again, those 10, 11, 12, it's closer to 14 or 15 now, sales or acquisitions of other businesses, which during that time period, uh, I, I, an individual reached out to me to, to coach him as, as he wanted to exit his business. He then brought me into his organization, had me meet his partner, kind of doing the same thing. I ended up taking over as COO of that business, an equity partner, then CEO now and managing partner of a company called MIT45, where from 2018, we did about 5 million in annualized revenue. 2022, we did just under 70 million. Wow. We've bought five other businesses during that timetable. And we're really positioning this for, for an IPO, which I think by the end of the year, will be pretty close to a billion dollar valuation on the Toronto Stock Exchange. We're, we're about... There's, there's a lot of trends that are showing will be pretty close. So it's really exciting to see how all these pieces come together in yeah, this yeah. moment where it's a little bit of everything, right? It's a direct response background. It's a sales background yeah, in the yeah. automotive industry. It's it's processing. It's processes. It's coaching, right? I don't think that ever goes away. So yeah. as you say, like an entrepreneur, what does that mean? Well, I'm, I'm fortunate to own, be, you know, equity partners in this business where I own a, a pretty good size, you know, tranche of it. Mm. I own 50% of a, a roofing company that I'm involved in a strategic roll-up of, of service-based businesses around around the Midwest. Yep. I own a handful of manufacturing businesses or parts of manufacturing businesses to manufacture supplements and other consumable goods. So mm -hmm. to me, it's that it's the quintessential thing of being a coach is great, being consultants is wonderful, but I think it also requires a certain level of applying those skills consistently. Right, because me as a consultant now is vastly different than me as a consultant, you know, four years ago. Because there's more knowledge, there's more, there's more practical application of, of what I've went through. So yeah. the game of business that I play, it's just different, not better or worse, but there's more that I've experienced. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, cool. So I mean, that kind of leads us to um, today and on and and today's topic that I uh, mentioned at the beginning of, of the episode. I think it'll be fun to dive into. In terms of like how do you like what goes into um actually let's start with like you know because not every coach is going to want to sell their business but for me personally i think it's good even if you don't really have a plan on it is to even pretend like you would at some stage sell the business have some type of as i say exit strategy um and maybe you can um speak to that and, and the importance i mean because i know the importance of that but for the coaches listening that may not know the importance of approaching a business that way, even if you have no plan of, of as they're selling it, like what's the importance of doing that? Yeah, Luke, wonderful, wonderful question. Wonderful thing to discuss. So I can see from both perspectives, right? My coaching business, I didn't build it to sell. I, I call it, it was an accidental entrepreneur. There was no plan behind it. There was very little intentionality. And I see the inefficiencies, right? Because in theory, that should still be operating and thriving right now. And I should still be receiving income from it, whether I sold it or push other people into the role to help run it. It was yeah. an income generating, revenue generating entity that I essentially shut down because I didn't do some of the things I'm going to share. So the, the value and benefits to me in creating a business to sell is it has you look through a separate lens at the business itself. Mm. Right. To me, it, it's great. We're in, in my experience, coaches and consultants, right? All of us collectively, we have a message, we have a passion, we want to help people. 
and it produces income. And that that's wonderful. But until you really build out at scale, you start to become, I call it a slave to the business itself, right? Mm-hmm. It's only as much as I can market. It's only as not the number of sales calls I can hop on. It's only the number of people I can impact. And there's no systems to it. There's no processes to it. And really what ends up happening is in order to sell a business, you have to sure up the vulnerabilities. And those vulnerabilities to start with, right? You look at, you know, Luke Charles and, and how that looks, right? I'm, I'm going to, if, if you're unfamiliar with this name, I would certainly encourage you to do a, a quick bit of research on it. But a gentleman named Garrett Gunderson, Garrett Gunderson, coach, consultant, and specialized in uh, really the infinite banking system, right? How do people, how to help people generate uh, wealth from, from their passive income, right? And not in the traditional sense. Well, Garrett started as Garrett Gunderson and Garrett Gunderson, right? He, he's very marketable, long hair. He's got a very distinct look. He's brilliant. He's humorous. He's, he's a wonderful individual. But as he's building out this business, not only was it systems and processes that he needed, but he started to realize in order to maximize this, I need to create a brand into itself. Mm. And so Garrett Gunderson was associated with and the founder of something called the Wealth Factory. And while it was still Garrett, to the outside world, everybody knew it was Garrett Gunderson, but he started mm. to brand the Wealth Factory. Mm. And as that started to grow, all right, Garrett actually sold it, give or take 12 or 14 months ago. And that sales process starts with, is, is any part of the machine that you have built inside your business vital? Meaning mm. you couldn't remove it. And so, if, again, if you're the name for it, there's mm. a chance you can sell it. But it's probably not for the highest multiple of earnings because you're going to have to come along for that ride. And mm-hmm. right, we can say things like Bob Proctor, Tony Robbins, right? Some very, very notable people. Mm-hmm. But even as we look at that, it's still them, right? How great yeah. would Tony, how great would Date with Destiny be if Tony Robbins wasn't the guy there teaching it? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But if he builds it a separate way, if he built it to sell, then over a period of time, he would start to have other coaches, other people from stage, more and more, and he starts to pull into the background. Right, we yep. can look at gym launch with with Alex and Layla, right? Yeah, the yeah. Hermoses, right? They've yeah, done a great yeah. job of that as as they sold that off and, and built acquisition.com. Yeah, yeah. And so, it's really starting to run things through the lens at a very very high level. Do you have processes documented? And that's literally everything from how do you sell to how do you market to how do you fulfill service. Do you have clear and concise financials? And it's okay to run it like a small business, right? Here in the states. You want to run some expenses through that. You want to be creative because you want to lower your tax burden. You're used to that in, in, in buying and selling businesses. It makes a lot of sense to do so. But you mm-hmm. still have to have up-to-date financials that are kept in a platform that, you know, QuickBooks or something comparable, not mm-hmm. an Excel spreadsheet to your bank account, right? Which is which is normal, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're doing bank account accounting where there's more money today than there was yesterday. Everything is fine. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not the best thing to, to sell the business. And then do you have a brand? Do you have a brand that precedes you, that, that's larger than just your name? And right, there's all types of different ways to build into that where um, it, there's nothing wrong with having your name. You just start to slowly co-brand things. There's a transition period. Yeah, where, yeah, yeah. You know, it could be Luke Charleston and then it, uh, the, the seven-figure coach's blueprint, making something up, of course. And yeah, over exactly. a period of time, Luke eventually falls off and everybody just knows the seven-figure coaching blueprint and it's a nice transition over a period of you know who knows 12 or 18 months yeah exactly i've seen a lot of coaches do that over the years actually yeah they <clears throat> they had their own personal name as the coach and they they slowly start to either like bring other um like the guys at traffic and funnels are a really good example so they they were the face of their company for many years within their advertising and then all of a sudden they started putting members from their staff in in the actual ad so the obviously that would give them a script and everything but they would yeah the, they would ha- start putting their their the staff in but like they would still do some ads but then their staff would do more and then all of a sudden like they're just not even uh, like on on any of the ads anymore so all, all people see now is just traffic and funnels as as the brand um do you so do you recommend let's pretend i was going to do it do you recommend that you actually change your name to something that is not like remove let's say for me as an example if i was to put my staff in my ads right that transition where they started delivering my marketing messages so i was removed from the face of the company it was still lukecharlton.com could you sell the company with the lukecharlton kind of like ogilvy right with the um advertising could you once you've built like if the continue to build the brand over whatever the next five to ten years so people know the name they don't know my face they don't know my face 
um, my staff are delivering whoever the, the marketing message. Could you still sell a business like like this? And, and the reason why I ask that is because a lot of coaches listening have their name branded, like have their business branded after their name, or is it smart just to completely remove your name from the whole, from the business? So another really good question. The answer is both, mm. right? You, you, there is a buyer for every business. Mm. Right now, I'll actually pivot this around on the backside and, and share a perspective in that. It's just, let's talk about if we, if we want to buy a business to help make our coaching businesses more successful, more profitable. And you have the chance to buy Ryan Idell and mm. Ryan Idell's coaching system, or you have a chance to buy, you know, Columbus Coaching Group or, mm. or something. Profitable. It's, you start to think of what is that transition and how much does Ryan Idell have to be involved to get mm -hmm. that brand equity to pivot over into what I just bought. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it's very little, right? Because if I'm not actively involved, just like you said, Luke, if I'm not in the ads, I'm not appearing anywhere, there's nothing going on with me in the front, it's less and less. But right? I'm not going to be as required to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. But if you have an agnostic brand that that doesn't ever have, I mean, not ever, but doesn't have, currently have a name associated with it, it's probably slightly lower barrier to entry to sell it. What mm -hmm. that really is you're probably able to get a slightly higher multiple of earnings for something mm -hmm. that isn't branded to you as a person, but both entities are sellable, right? You bring up traffic and funnels. I got the incredible privilege of helping Taylor and Chris behind the scenes for, for a, a decent amount of time as, yep. as they were stepping away from the business and figuring uh -huh. out and creating some systems and processes. So much of what you see there, I don't want to take credit for it, right? They're brilliant individuals. They've done a, yeah. a fascinating job with, with yeah. the enterprise that they built, but they were following a very comparable playbook. It's saying, gosh, if we want to sell this off, we want to step away from it. How can we do that? Still gain, still gain the income from it. Mm. Still have an impact in it, but only do exactly what we want to do. Mm. And that was kind of the initial entry point into, I'll say a different reality for them. Yeah. Very cool. And, um, I guess my next question, probably a lot of coaches are wondering, like, how do you actually, you know what, before we get there, one of the things that, that that I know is really powerful in terms of marketing for a um, for a business, and you see some big companies do this sometimes, is is you actually like insurance companies sometimes, for example, they'll they'll lead with a certain personality, so they'll hire like an actor, usually someone that's not a lot of the time that's not famous, but they'll put that person as like the personality, and it'll often be like kind of joking around and stuff. They'll become like a quirky nature to that personality or whatever, and so the 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 idea there and it can be very effective is that you start to associate the relationship with that person even though they're not the name of the company so could it could you um even though like luchan.com wouldn't have me as the face it would still probably have my personality associated with it just like a bob proctor or a tony robbins company would if it was eventually sold um couldn't that be spun in terms of like as a benefit because of it it's you know because then Pete, as like you mentioned like an agnostic company there's no person it's a bit more corporate with coaching we're, we're also selling like a, a person as much as a product right people are buying a person so couldn't that be spun as more of a benefit in the sales process? i'm just kind of brainstorming here um as a marketing guy like how could this actually be a benefit um of course yeah do you, think, you know what, what i'm trying to ask there could it actually be seen as a benefit i'm sure for the right person it, it could but i would say that it's almost like a benefit to have a personality that could still kind of be part of the company, maybe in the emails or whatever, um, mm -hmm. to build that bond with the um, with the prospects before they buy the coaching. Well, you're you're exactly correct, Luke. I mean, we could we can dive, especially when we talk marketing. Let's look at Agora and mm -hmm. how Agora, you know, creates creates personalities that are the person sending the emails for the period of time, and you, you start to become bonded to to yep. that person. And yep. there is a, a tremendous amount of benefit and value to that across the board because there is that that feeling but as we say that then i have to also share the counterpoint to that take take verizon wireless that had you know the, the old can you hear me now and it was a gentleman with the glasses i don't know if you mm. saw that you know overseas nice. but here in the states this this gentleman had a five or six year contract the minute yeah. the contract expired at&t reached out locked him in and it created a whole a whole level of brand confusion where he was actually uh -huh. able to start throwing stones at his previous employer because uh, it wasn't down right the right way in a contract. So it can go both ways, right? It's it's right from the marketing aspect, it was brilliant. You see, you know, this this five years of embedded this command over and over again. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah. 
guy walking around saying, can you hear me now? And he's very distinct in the way that he looks. And then you see him with the competitor. And he's on yeah. and he's saying, well, now I know you can hear me because I'm on the right network. It, it, was, yeah. it was very, very, very clever. Yeah. But all of that to say, to say, Luke, that to really zoom out for just a second, there's yeah. two specific type of buyers in most situations. There's a financial buyer and a strategic buyer. A financial buyer is going to be someone that's just looking at the dollars and cents of the business. They're looking at something called, you know, return on investment capital. They're probably not going to be intimately involved in the day-to-day operations. They're probably going to put a CFO or someone in, in place to look at the money. And they're going to sit kind of passively in the background. They're going to want you, Luke, to still probably stay in the driver's seat or whoever the current CEO is. Yeah, That's more a financial buyer. A strategic buyer is, let's say you have a, a health and wellness coaching company. Well, you've grown this thing to scale. And all of a sudden, uh, a, a, a gym conglomerate, we'll say a, a lifetime fitness here in the States, says, gosh, if we bought that coaching, we could we could mirror that and push everybody to our gyms and there would be a strategy involved with the, the cross-correlation of business entities. Hmm. Most coaching companies, to me, actually sell more in a strategic manner than a financial manner because we're, we're pretty niche down, right? We're focused on a vertical... And so you start to look, if you ever want to consider selling your business, of, well, who would want to buy this? Well, it's someone that would get an intrinsic value from being associated with your brand. Again, health and wellness. Maybe maybe it's a, a supplement company that wants to buy it because you've got the cog, you've got all the, the marketing, you've got the data coming in, and they know their LTV on their customers, and there's a good synergy there. Or, right, it can be any number of different things. It could be an insurance company, right, that wants healthy individuals to lower the insurance premiums to, to divest their pool. Right? Mm-hmm. There's so many different ways to really start to look at who would buy the business that it all starts from, you know, going back to the first part of our conversation, slowly working through a process to make sure that your business is as sellable as possible. Mm-hmm. And it's it's process documentation. It's removing bottlenecks. It's all the things you also have to do simultaneously to scale your business. Right? And yeah. I know you know this. Yeah, anyway. exactly right. Yeah, I'm it's in the process of that right now, actually. Um, it's all bottlenecks. So, you know, you just for the coach listening in, it's really, if you want to sell your business, you just look at all the bottlenecks of like, <laughs> you know, your sales calls is going to be a big one. Um, it's going to be your delivery is the other big one, right? So if you had to t- train someone to do the sales calls for you, obviously you need to script, create a sales script for them. That's your SOP. That's your sales. That's your process. And then in terms of like your coaching, which is a big part of of what coaches love, right? That's what they do, right? Is their coaching. But um you know, if you want to be able to step away from the business, be able to go on holidays or whatever, you need to have that process documented out so other people can fulfill that for you. And then you can either not choose to work or choose to work with just the dream clients that you would really love to work with. Um, again, I think it's, yeah, it's about building an asset that works for you that as opposed to you working for it. Otherwise, it just becomes another job, really. Um, and that's, I think, is a big, a huge benefit to thinking about if I was going to sell it, what would I need to what are the bottle, all the bottlenecks I'd need to remove or what is everything that I have to systemize and, and lay out a process for? And as you said, that's going to benefit you just in the, <laughs> in the immediate term, whether you sell it or not. It's such a, it's a very rewarding and beneficial process. Come, come all right. Um, I, I guess my, my next question is probably a lot of coaches um, wondering is like, what is like, how do you, val- how do you, um, and it's going to be hard because you said because some coaching businesses are very kind of vertical niche kind of orientated. So the actual valuation of that type of company is probably a lot different to other companies. So if I'm doing, let's say, a million dollars, a hundred thousand per month, which is a, a big goal that um, a lot of coaches want to get to, is a hundred thousand dollars per month. So let's say I'm a I'm a coach doing a hundred thousand dollars per month. I've got my sales, you know, everything systemized. Right, I've got my um, sales calls coming in automatically. Someone's doing the calls for me. People are delivering my actual sales process. I'm just more just at the top of the the business here. So all of my bottlenecks are, it's like the e-myth uh, dream scenario, right? Where you're working on your business and everyone's doing all the work for you um, in terms of marketing, sales and delivery. That type of business, how would, like, what, how would you value, like, what would that be worth? Is it generally just like 10 times the value? Like, how do you work out the market valuation? Yeah, n- another brilliant question, Luke. So... There's, there's tranches in in the in the marketplace and most businesses at the, at a different level of sophistication and that doesn't mean size necessarily it means 
if a private equity company is looking at you or an insurance company is looking to buy you, they're not going to be looking at a multiple of revenue. They're going to be looking at a multiple of what's referred to as EBITDA. And EBITDA is an acronym of stands for earnings before taxes, interest, depreciation, and amortization. Essentially a fancy term of saying net income. Yeah. Right. So expenses prior to taxes is a really, I'm sorry, income prior to taxes, less expenses. Yep. And so in that world, the first big hurdle happens at a million dollars a year in EBITDA, right? That's where you start to see the big difference between a company doing $800,000 a year and a company doing $1.1 million a year. There, there's a big variance where maybe something at $800,000 a year is a 2x multiple and yeah. at $1.2 million, it could be a 4x multiple. Now, there's, okay. some, there's some nuance of that, Luke, and, and the nuances to consider no different than anything else. What sort of contracts do you have? What's your monthly and annual recurring revenue that is contractually stated? And then yeah. what's the churn rate of your customers? Also mirrored with LTV, right? If, yeah. if you've got a great engine that you can onboard new clients, they go through your 90 or 90 day or six month program, maybe it's a year program, mm -hmm. and you see a big, a big drop off, right? There's no continuing model for them. Well, that's going to lower the value because you have to look at if I'm buying your business and I'm paying you two times what you're making in a year, I'm really assuming that I can make your business 50% better by stepping in because I want to repay myself over a year's period. But in order to do that, it has to be incredibly stable. It has to be incredibly sticky. Things have to be really, really dialed in. And so that's when we start to get those higher multiples. It's not only revenue, but it's also the undercurrent of how the business works. Is your LTV consistently growing? Is your churn rate decreasing? How are your refunds and chargebacks? Right. What are, what are those contracts you have with people? And are they honoring them? Right. We can all write contracts, but are people excited to honor the contract? And they begrudging like, oh man, yeah. I signed up for eighteen months and I get to twelve months and boy, I just I just want out. I stop showing up. Yeah. So all those have a nuance to it. So it's a one million mark. It's a five million mark, and then it's it, it's north of five million. And oddly enough, the larger the deals, the larger the company, the easier it is to find somebody to buy it. It's kind yeah. of kind of what you think. It's just. As, as someone that has a, a fund myself that I get the privilege of managing, yeah. if I can deploy $5 million, it takes the same amount of work for me to do due diligence. It takes the yeah. same amount of underwriting. But yeah. My return on that $5 million should be exponentially greater than five hundred grand. but it takes the same work to get there. So yeah. the larger the company, the easier it is. But then I can pivot that, right? It sounds duplicitous. It's not intended to be. As I look at one of the things that I would encourage you as a coach to be open to considering it, how many Facebook groups exist that you could buy right now for pennies on the dollar that have never monetized that have your ideal client in it? How many blogs could you buy that have a mailing list that have a subscriber base that they've never monetized it because they don't know how? There are yeah. all these feeders that come into an ecosystem that most of us don't consider, but someone that's very passionate about writing, and then we'll go back to health and wellness. Someone can be incredibly passionate about educating people on health and wellness trends. They can grow this great subscriber list. They can see their impressions going to a million a month, but they have no clue how to monetize it because it's never been their passion. Yeah, All yeah. they get is creating content. Well, you get to swoop in potentially, give that person six months of, of annual expenses, right? If, if the company generates yeah. $100,000 a year, you might be able to buy it for fifty or $60,000. Mm, mm. And now you have a built-in lead mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can repay that very, very quickly. And a lot of those individuals are very comfortable with an owner finance deal where you might yeah. perhaps $20,000 today and pay them $5,000 a month over the rest of the year. Yeah. That's how you yeah. bought the business. Yeah. And now you're monetizing their data in such a way that your company is worth more and more. And simultaneously, like, man, I know affiliate marketing too. So I'm going to get an affiliate offer for a couple of things. I'm going to grow the mailing list. And yeah. all of a sudden, now you're building this enterprise as a coach that has tenants that are spreading out that makes your company worth a lot more money in the open marketplace because it's 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 diversified but diversified in the same niche yeah i love that i've never that man my brain is going crazy right now thinking of different ideas like but i never thought about like buying facebook groups or buying blogs i mean there's a lot of youtube channels out there that have, have a lot of good con like the amount of youtube channels that i watch it blows my mind because i watch a lot of youtube financial stuff economic stuff where they just don't end an episode with a call to action just to a lead magnet. Like, hey, just jump on my email list. They don't do anything. Are they Sometimes they might say, look in the description below, like go to my website or whatever, but that's very rare. Um, they don't do basic direct response uh, marketing. 
um, that, you know, the coach listening that knows just a little bit about marketing, them a little bit more than what these other content creators or people that own that asset do, like they don't realize the value of what they have because and they, cause they don't know how to monetize it. So as, I love that strategy. It's again, my, my brain's going, uh, going crazy right now thinking of different ideas. Um, what, what, uh, forgive me for interrupting you, Luke, but what becomes so fascinating is there's websites like BizBuySell and Flippa.com that you can literally peruse what's on there. You can see things very openly and don't don't become dis disgruntled by seeing what somebody wants for their business. Mm. The business broker that gets that site listed, they're telling somebody to put it at 20, 30, 40% premium because they know there's gonna be some negotiation back and forth. Okay. And most people, because they haven't ever sold a business before, don't really know what they're doing. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, it's not taking advantage of people at all, but yeah. If I, if I have this asset that I've grown that I'm not monetizing and I'm kind of just bored, I'm, I'm kind of over it. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. You eventually it's a point that something is better than nothing. And so you get very, you get very open to create a deal structure mm. where it might be. You want a hundred thousand dollars for this asset that you've built. And me as a coach, maybe I have that money. Maybe I don't, but it'd be natural to say, gosh, I don't have it. So I can't buy it. It's actually almost never true. You might be able to offer them $130,000, but it's going to take you 18 months to pay it off. Right, right, yeah. With the money from their asset. <laughs> Correct. Exactly right. Because in their mind, it's not it's not going to produce that much money. So like, why would you ever give me more than I'm asking for? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because you know your coaching service is worth, you know, generating X and you back on the conversions. You really hit the nail on the head, Luke. If you have just a small, I mean, to be a coach or a mentor or consultant in today's world, you have to have an understanding of direct response. You have to have a, an understanding of something that creates a conversion point. Mm. You just apply that to these these slightly yeah. off base, nuanced companies, and you can do very, very well in short periods of time. Where you can buy one or two of these bold on the year, yeah. and have them being actual positive in six or seven months. And now you're grow Now you have almost I call it an unfair advantage, right? Because you're buying a YouTube channel, you're buying a Facebook, yeah, you're yeah. buying a mailing list and a blog. Now all of a sudden, those have a synergistic relationship. So you're pushing traffic from each one to the other one. Yeah, so you're growing yeah. How much those are worth and pushing it all back to your coaching. It's yeah. like, it's this content flywheel that we're all wanting to create, but you're buying it versus building it from scratch. Nice. And do you, um, do you recommend that? Like say a coach again, cause it's very, um, let's say a coach goes to another content creator that just doesn't know how to monetize their asset, whatever it is, the blog, Facebook group, um, email list, whatever. Do you recommend that that coach lets that person stay as the face of their content? It's almost like a referral, like you're just using them as a referral, even though you technically own the asset, if that makes sense, because you're still kind of leveraging that person's know, like, and trust mm -hmm. um, to generate the leads. I do. If we, if we can get them to stick around, I think that's always preferable. What yeah. I see happen quite often is somewhere between a three and six month transition period where someone's comfortable sticking around and it gives you time to understand their processes, yeah. understand a transition, right? Because think about it logically. If you or I sold our business, I don't know that I want to have a boss all of a sudden if I've been an entrepreneur, right? And yeah, so it's yeah. like, yeah, okay, hold on. I, I want to help you take over the reins, but gosh, I don't be doing this again a year from now because I would have just kept the business. Yeah, yeah. As my so we have to start thinking about, again, that, that process optimization. Can we find someone in the open market to plug into that role? Because we don't probably want more work. Like you said, the e -myth. It's you want to buy self-managing companies. You want to buy back your time. And you're really buying down your cost of acquisition with these. It might mm. not feel like a micro. You're, you're now getting acquisitions for fractions of pennies versus hundreds of dollars in appointment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Man, this has given me a lot of ideas. Um, it's been a great interview, Ryan. Uh, now, before I've got one more question. Um, bef actually, I've got two more questions. Number one is, is there anything that coaches should consider? Um, actually, I've got three. Uh, number one. Um, when it comes to like, so let's say I want to sell my business for say 4 million or whatever it is, the valuation, it, is it, do people usually buy that on like finance? Is it usually multiple investors going in on that? Or is it, and are they usually paying like upfront or is it just depending on the structure of the deal? Like how does someone come up with say 4 million or 10 million or 20 million? Now you've got private equity firms um, that specifically buy businesses. Is that where most businesses are sold to private equity or, or is there single people that also buy and invest in, in, in businesses as well. And are they generally paying up front or how does that work? Yes. So that's, that's where those tranches come back into play, right? What I see is some of the smaller deals, deals that are, you know, maybe the enterprise values, 
half a million dollars or so, which is still a tremendous amount of money. But you or I could probably figure out how to, you know, maybe at least here in the States, take a mortgage out on our house, use right. some credit cards, get a small business loan. And you can probably buy that half million to million dollar company. You can probably yeah. figure that out. Yeah. You get much above that and you end up having to look at either, uh, I'll say a, a micro PE fund. So maybe it's not a large private equity company, but it's a pool of people's money. Or yeah. it ends up being a much larger conglomerate with a lot of free cash flow to buy mm -hmm. the business. And then, right, me as someone that buys businesses, it's really my job to figure out how to get you to like the deal using as little capital out of my pocket as possible. All right. And right. so if I can convince you that, look, here's, if the company's worth a million dollars, I'm going to give you $300,000 right now. Yeah. And I'll pay you the extra 700 over the next 18 months. And here's all the reasons and rationale why. And if you feel yeah. comfortable with it, you hit the nail on the head earlier. I'm essentially buying your business with your business's free cash flow. Yeah, you just yeah. don't see it because I gave you enough money up front. You don't notice it. Yeah. And so yeah. as a seller, you want as much cash straight away as possible. Right. Yeah, you want exactly right. the yeah. largest check in your hand as possible. Yeah. There's normally some sort of carry forward to, to coaches, you know, and consultants like us where there's that transition period and there's going to be what's referred to as hurdle rates. Meaning if your company is worth a million dollars, perhaps you get 600 grand right now. As long as the business continues to grow as it has been growing every quarter for the next four quarters, you get another hundred thousand mm. dollars. Maybe there's a success bonus at the end. That's an extra 50 grand. If, if everything's going just so yeah. but during that same time period, the opposite is true. If you start missing the growth objectives, you don't get the cash. Yeah, and so you're only guaranteeing that 600 grand and you're giving up your company. That's a pretty, typical deal structure okay it's interesting like listening to um this for the coaches just pointing this out all the different ways you can structure a deal right like i think it's the key is d like creativity um as you said like you can buy buy businesses without any money down if you do it the right way um i think that's what roland frazier teaches he's got a program on that like how to buy a business without any money down so um and that's all about um deal structure right and looking at i guess the best place to start is looking at how other people do it that will give you ideas and then and then you can take those ideas to as i said buy like as you said buy a facebook group buy a, a blog or whatever buy a youtube channel and use that to to build your business that would be a good place to start i think before buying a like a it'd be more relevant to the coaches listening i would say because they most coaches listening want to generate more leads and appointments so i think that would be a great a great place to start um yeah a lot of a lot of value here now second last question um, is there any any other mistakes or things that a coach should consider when um, when selling their business? This is, this is, this is a, a painful lesson that I had to learn. If I go back to the to the web hosting days, it, it's spending some time in the parts that you probably don't like to spend, which is normally accounting, right? It's accounting and finance, and there's a difference between cash based accounting and accrual based accounting. And let's let's talk about. You as a coach, you sign somebody up for a year-long mastermind. Right? That, that might be a common thing. And they pay you twenty dollars or $25,000 today. And so that's income for you, right? That hit, hits your bank account. You can spend it today. That's a cash-based accounting model. An accrual-based accounting model says you took that twenty five dollars but you have to actually have to fulfill a service over 12 months. So while you have twelve twenty five dollars in your bank account, you can actually only capitalize $2,000 of that a month. So your income is actually $2,000 a month versus $25,000 today. Now it's not because you have the cash in your hand. So mm -hmm. where it gets a little confusing that as your company starts to grow and you start pushing towards those higher multiple exits, you, know, you, you, wanna, you wanna see those seven figure exits, your books need to be kept in an accrual basis because that's how the next level of the business game right. looks finance specifically. Uh, and so we got our absolute teeth kicked in, Luke, on the on the web hosting exit because we were selling five year web hosting packages. The company yeah. was doing forty or fifty million dollars a year, so we thought in revenue. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't because people were paying four hundred dollars for five years of web hosting. Yeah, yeah. And what it really was is we needed to pull out that that money over a five year period. Yeah. So our revenue, we thought it was up here. And by the time we go to the negotiation table, it's way down here. And we're like, what what do you mean it's that low? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Explain it. And th this exit that we thought was going to be life changing, that was going to, you know, we're going to retire before 30, was yeah. was just enough to smile and shake each other's hand and go yeah, do something. Yeah, yeah wow. Yeah, that's cr 
Crazy. So do you, would you say that revenue by, um, sorry, recurring revenue models are uh, much, because that's kind of like, as long as the churn isn't too high and everything, that would be more of a, a much more appealing type company to buy something that has recurring revenue. Is that correct? It absolutely is. It's kind of like doing that automatically for you, just getting a certain amount each each month. Yes, yeah. c completely agree. It's yeah. it's that combination of what is your your monthly recurring revenue as a percentage of revenue. It is is there any one marketing source that's more than twenty percent of your revenue? So in a perfect world, right, you'd have referrals at twenty percent, you'd have your email list at twenty percent, you'd have Facebook at twenty percent, you might have you know TikTok yeah, yeah. or IG. Yeah. So you'd, you'd be pretty diversified in where the the revenue is coming from. You'd be pretty diversified in product offering where it's not just one offer, which is yeah. you know counterintuitive how we start, but at scale, you need a couple different offers so that the so that you don't have a vulnerability point there. Right. You want to maximize LTV, right? So do you have a clear, concise path that can go on for five years where you're consistently adding value to someone and they want to stay in your program? And then it's what's the churn and, and refund rate? So there's it's a multivariate equation when you really get down to it. But yeah. as long as you're focused on it from from this moment. It still makes your business more successful. That's what's always yeah. so asset This is like you get it from where you're at. It's yeah. gosh, if you just focus on how can I serve the client for the longest amount of time, getting them to achieve more and more and more, and do it in this honest, ethical, integrous way. Well, the nature of that is your LTV grows. The nature of that is people feel really good signing up for another six months or a year. Mm -hmm. The nature of that, like, all these things go simultaneously together versus again how I started, which was 90 day commitment, no upsell no cross sell, no long term continuity, no offer. It's like, yeah. while that works, it's, it puts you on this hamster where you never get off it. <laughs> it's very tiring. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, you know, I think there is a lesson in there in a really important lesson. And this is where like, you know, coaches listening to an interview like this, they go, Okay, I need to have all these things in I need to have like this recurring offer now mapped out, I need to have this mapped out. Personally, what I would recommend coaches listening is do what you do is you take action first, get the cash flow coming in first, and then you make these adjustments as you go and as you grow. You don't need to have everything systemized and written out right in the beginning. I'd rather see you take action, get results, and use the cash flow to that to you know keep your business alive and then implement like what you're talking about here, Ryan. Would you agree? I, I, I would not only agree, I would implore you as you're listening to follow exactly what Luke said. Right, there's that paralysis by analysis. You're trying to get too many yeah. things done in too short of a time. To me, it's very difficult to teach somebody how to do something for you until you become, I'll say, a level of master at it. So, while I might want to outsource my sales calls, until I know that I can always convert for me at that twenty or thirty percent, I'm probably not quite ready to outsource the sales calls. So, I got to get better at that that craft. That's that's my thought process. And right, there's a bunch of different thought processes to this. But same thing with with fulfillment, same thing with all these other nuances. Can you get it so that it feels like it's almost automatic? The minute you get to it, it feels automatic. It's very predictable. Then I like to use something, right? I mean, we might as well at least throw this out there as a hack for people. It, using something like Chat GPT, right? If, if you're familiar with the AI platform, Chat GPT, you can go ahead and take your sales script. You can record your call, record your Zoom, whatever you're having your call on, feed it into Chat GPT and have it create its own level of SOP, its own process documentation. Oh, wow. You. you can do the same thing with your coaching That's and cool. fulfillment. Every coaching call you have, have it turn it into a syllabus for you because now we have AI that can help support building some of these processes. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah. It uh, doesn't for us to, to hyper slow down. We just create more leverage in what we're already doing, which helps start to bolster up that framework a little quicker than maybe you or I experienced as, as we build our businesses, right? I, I didn't have that luxury. It was... You know, yeah, I didn't think yeah. about that. I thought about like getting it to a, a VA or something to type up, but that's pretty cool. So I don't know if Chat GPT can do this now, but could you feed it like multiple? Let's say I do like a hundred coaching calls, like get them kind of transcribed or whether just feed that to the system, and can it take an amalgamation like a of all the calls together and map out the process? Is it that smart to do that yet? It is that smart. So it, it's so right. smart, Luke. That. I'm using it to create offering memorandums as I want to sell businesses. It's creating the offering memorandum. It's also helping me analyze deals that I want to buy. So wow. it, it, it's doing it at such a scale and capacity that we could have a whole secondary conversation on the power. Of we should actually, I, I, that'd be a great podcast because it's so, it's a new thing. Um, and um, I'd love, I don't, haven't used it yet. I've, I've read a, a bit about it. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it sounds amazing. It, it is. I, 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 I cringe to say it's a game changer. I think that gets overused. But what it really is is doing, I don't think it's going to replace human beings. I don't think it's so sophisticated that all of a sudden we don't yeah, have to do anymore. Yeah. But what it does is it creates leverage points on the things that take us a long period of time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so a perfect example. I, w I was a part of a training last Friday. It was an eight-hour in-person training. Mm. The, the host recorded it all, right? It, it's video. By the time the event was done, the video had been transcribed. He fed it in chat GPT. Chat GPT came up with an eight-point syllabus for what was covered. He then took that eight-point syllabus, fed it back into chat GPT, and said, I need four sub-points for every one of the eight points. It did that. It he took that and said, okay, turn those eight or four sub-points into attention-grabbing headlines for social media posts. And it created attention-grabbing headlines. Then he said, turn it into full social post for each one of those attention-grabbing headlines. He did all that before the event was over. So something wow. would have taken him two or three weeks to, to do with the team, right? VAs yeah. and all these pieces and parts. Yeah. It was done before we left the room. That he had the whole content flywheel built. Now, it's not perfect, right? It's still going to need some human interaction. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. 90% yeah. of the lifting is done inside of an hour that used yeah. to take two weeks. And it, yeah. it's all the power of machine learning. And each individual instance, like when you create your own account, it learns from you in its own, in, in its own chat sequence. It's pretty specific to you. So there's, there's really a lot of powerful ability to not only create better copy, right? You can use Jasper, things like that. That, that certainly will work as well. But yeah, yeah. GPT and GPT-3, with you want to get really crazy with this, GPT-4 is coming out in May, right? Yeah. Which, which is the next iteration. If you want to look at, at the size in comparison, GTP-3 is, a, let's just say it's the size of the, of the globe right now, the, the, yeah. the Earth. GPT-4 is larger than the sun with how wow. much data it's going to pool and how much more sophisticated it's going to be. So it's not to say, oh gosh, God. jump in right away. But yeah. you can do yeah. so much inside your business by feeding it into the system. So as, as a solopreneur, as maybe an individual that's you and a setter or you and a closer or you and another coach, man, it's like you, you, you don't need a lot of these extra resources that so many of us needed. So your your yeah. net income stays higher. So your valuation stays higher. Yeah, yeah. It's gained. Oh man, we need to, let's have a, I'll have you back on the podcast. Um, cause this is a whole other, we could go for another like two hours on this. Um, but we'll wrap up there and I, I will, I'll have you back on cause I'd love to, if you want to go back on that is obviously. Oh, yeah. Honored. yeah, no, this, this sounds like a, a lot of fun just to give coaches like, cause I have questions about my, cause I do, I teach email, like how to send daily emails. Like I think I, we could use that for my clients and helping them create their emails. Anyway, um, let's wrap up, wrap up though. This, uh, this episode has been amazing. Um, anything, um, I just want to make sure it's yeah, it's still going. It says, anyway, uh, Ryan, where can, um, actually no, one quick question. You're standing at the, this is, I asked this for all guests. You're standing at the top of a mountain. There's a thousand, thousands of coaches below you. You can only shout to them one message for them to be more successful. What is that message? You are capable of far more than a year self credit for your impacts bigger than you can realize the daily activities uh, that you do that you don't think people notice. More people are seeing than you could ever, ever imagine. Love it. Love it. Very powerful. Um, all right, Ryan, where can the coaches go to um, learn more about you and what it is that you do? Yes, Luke. So it's ryanidel.com. That's R-Y-A-N-N-I-D-D-E-L.com. Kind of the opposite of how I used to be. I don't have a course. I don't have something to sell you. I do have an email list where I, I, I share, you know, a couple tips per week that are that might be of value to you. And then social media posts or, or social media platforms. So it's just Ryan Idell on every platform. And, and Luke, if you're okay with it, certainly not looking to grow my list on the backside of your hard work. But I actually have um, some of Roland's stuff that I've went through, some of my own deal flow, where I've got 130 or 140 different ways to structure deals oh, that cool. don't require a bunch of capital. I'd be honored just to give it to anybody. I don't have so I, again. I'm not. I don't have yeah, something please. to sell you. Give it to me. That. I'll have that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> How about this, Luke? I'll give it to you, and you you give it to everybody that that wants something. Have them just okay. email you. I, Thank I, you. I certainly so appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, man. I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to look at all the different ways you can structure deals. Um, so for any coach listening that wants that, just give me an email. If you're watching this, you're probably on my on my email list. If not, just go to my website and get on my email list, and I'll give you that. Um, the yeah, that document. I appreciate that, Ryan. That's um, 
very generous and kind of you. So also give coming on and giving up your time as it's been an amazing interview. I got a ton of value out of it. I'd love to have you on again to talk about chat GPT um, and how coaches can use it to grow your business. But once again, thanks for coming on, giving your time. And also away from your wife who I know has just <laughs> come out of the just come out of surgery. So hopefully she's um she's on the mend and as I appreciate you coming down and, and doing this interview with us. Yes, thanks, Luke. I, I had a great time. Thank you so much. No worries. And thanks again for all the coaches listening in. And I uh, hope you got some value out of this and we'll see you on next week's episode.